Okay. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about my, one of my PhD projects, which is the cranial osteology of pachycomus and relati relationships and divergence times amongst pachycomiforms. Uh, so pachycomiforms are considered to be stem teleosts. They're very early diverging stem teleosts. And um, that makes them part of the most largest and most diverse clade of fish. And they account for almost half of all vertebrate species as actinopterygians. Uh, they ranged from the Toarcian of the uh, Mid-Jurassic to the Maastrichtian of the Late Cretaceous. And they are known from deposits all around the world, including Europe and North America, and even as far away as Australia, North America, and most recently, Antarctica. So what makes pachycomiforms quite interesting as examples of stem teleos is that they show this range of morphology and ecological diversity. So you've got the fish-eating pachycomus and hypsocomus, which are generally considered to be um, ecological homologues of tuna. And then we've got the giant body suspension feeders, such as leeds ichthys, which are generally considered to be precursors to Mississippi whales and giant suspension feeding chondrichthians, such as the whale shark. So despite the fact that we you know, have all this information about pachycomiforms, we actually don't know much about their interrelationships. And there's been some dispute over their placement at, relative to their sister taxa. This is generally because the fossils are quite um, incomplete or completely disarticulated like this one or flattened, which means that our inferences are pretty much limited to just the easily observable external features rather than the important complex internal features such as the brain case and the gill skeleton that can tell us a lot about ecology and phylogeny, but are sadly generally hidden. This makes 3D preserved fossils such as these extremely important because they are, sorry, um, they're not generally studied in close detail, although because pachycomiforms are so, gen so well known in the fossil record, we do have quite a few really nice 3D preserved fossils that have not been studied. So my project has studied on scanning one of these fossils that was found in Strawberry Bank in Somerset. That is a Toarcian deposit um, around about the Dorset coast. And it's generally well known for well-preserved specimens. We're using Pachycomus because it is generally the type species used to represent them in um, stem teleos studies to represent pachycomiforms and is quite an early diverging example of pachycomiforms. Um, very recently, actually, we had scientists at the University of Bristol that, have, that has described the external structures of pachycomus, meaning that I can focus on the internal structures using t CT scanning. So that's the aim of my project. I'm going to scan and re-describe the internal and external anatomy of pachycomus with the hope of improving our understanding of pachycomiform morphology, ecology, and phylogenetic position, and also use some uh, phylogenetic methods to understand their interrelationships and hopefully their divergence times too. So like I said, this is the fossil that I used. It's from the Tawasian deposit of Strawberry Bank and has been housed at the Bath Royal Library and Scientific Institution and then scanned at the University of Bristol. Um, I then imported those, that scan into Mimics and segmented out all the internal structures that I could find and rendered those structures in Blender so I could look at individual structures or in that anatomical context to describe and identify characters for a phylogenetic analysis. So from the fossil, this is the result that I got. Um, we've got some extremely complex structures in here that have managed to be preserved almost perfectly in situ. It's a very beautiful fossil on the inside that would normally have been hidden if we'd not CT scanned it. And that means that I can start looking at um, characters that can be used to inform a phylogenetic analysis. So for example, we've got the gill skeleton which is extremely well preserved in this fossil. And most interestingly, we've managed to get out the gill rakers as well. Now in Pachycomus, these are quite short gill rakers. That means that they tend to just lie in the sides and they just generally protect the gills from any kind of detritus. Um, but this is in sharp contrast to what we've seen in um, other Pachycomiforms, particularly the suspension feeders, such as Martelithus renwickii, which has these really long modified gill rakers that tend to be used to facilitate suspension feeding. We also had the brain case, and this is quite rare because generally the brain case doesn't ossify well enough for us to get a, get a um, model of it. But it means that we can see things such as the um, foramina for the aorta, the vagus, the vagus nerves, and the notochord at the back of the brain case, which again can help us infer a phylogenetic analysis. Most importantly, though, we've managed to get a really nice 
um, pectoral fin and shoulder girdle and the fin radials. And these have not been described very well in pachycomas before. But in this, we managed to get out the individual um, fin radials and look at their morphology in very close detail to describe them. So now that we've got our description, we can look at um, a coding of phylogenetic analysis. Now, my matrix was taken from one constructed by Friedman in 2012. And I took um, aspects of that and aspects of corrections from Arati and Schultze and some adapted characters from Giles et al. 2017 in order to reconstruct a more, more informative phylogenetic analysis. So in Friedman 2012's matrix, there are 121 characters and 29 taxa. I added 10 completely new characters, mainly around, around about the Gilraker morphology. Um, I changed individual characters in 28 instances, so I looked at the whole matrix again and made sure that it was all correct with what we knew. I updated the Pachycormus coding with our new description, and then I added seven taxa, which is Pachycormus. I atomized Orthocormus into its three recognized species, and I also included Espiderinchids because they're generally considered to be the sister taxa to Pachycormoforms. So in a parsimony analysis, this is the result that I've got. Pachycormus is in the kind of red box in there. You can see it's actually been resolved as an early diverging stem telio, uh, not stem telios, early diverging pachycomiform, as we kind of already knew. Um, and aspidorinchids have been placed as part of the um, sister taxa to pachycomiforms. The Bayesian analysis said roughly the same thing. Pachycomus came out as quite an early diverging pachycomiform, and aspidorinchids are the sister taxa to pachycomiforms again, um, but with a slightly lower resolution mainly around the outgroups at the top. Interestingly, we also had the giant suspension feeders um, grouped as a monophyletic clade. And this supports all previous analyses already, but some of the um, characters that supported this were these funky gill rakers that I mentioned earlier, suggesting that maybe this gill raker morphology is informing not only just ecology, ecology but also phylogeny. So after that, we decided to take things a little bit further we started to add 12 nuclear genes for my four extant taxa and the stratigraphic information for all my extinct taxa. This meant that I could build a fossilized birth-death model and, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, use Mr. Bayes to ask more complex questions about pachycomiform interrelationships and divergences using a tip dating analysis. Sadly, the whole thing kind of collapsed at that point, which <laughs> was a bit of a shame. Pachycomiforms are relatively well resolved. There's a few kind of discrepancies if you're going to be kind of pedantic about it, such as Pachycomus now sits in the slightly different clade to what it did in the parsimony and original Bayesian analysis. Um, but mainly the collapse comes from the outgroups, such as the Spiderinchids that now form just a rake at the bottom of the tree. Um, the other thing that we managed to kind of get was these. Um, divergent states that actually seem to be quite accurate to what we predicted. So Pachycomus diverged around about 181 million years ago, and Pachycomiforms in general diverged around 192 million years ago. However, I'm not going to stop there. So at the moment, my work is going to focus on um, altering the parameters of my analysis. Given that the morphology-only data managed to get such a nicely resolved tree, adding data such as um, stratigraphy and DNA shouldn't create this huge rake. Hopefully we can kind of like alter my parameters and make sure that my model fits my data a bit more kind of cleanly. So once I've done all that, then my future work is going to focus on looking at the interrelationships of the edentulist pachycomal form clade and work resolving their relationships. So currently we know that they existed from around about the Toarcian until the Maastrichtian, but we don't know how they evolved from these middle-sized fish eating fish to become giant suspension feeders and also why they went extinct. Um, we assume it was the end of Cretaceous mass extinction, but we're scientists, assumptions are lazy. Um, so my, my work is going to kind of focus on resolving what happened there and also what happened once they went extinct. So were the giant suspension feeding chondrichthians always around and just competing with pachycomiforms or did they exploit an mm. a vacant niche once the Pachycomiforms disappeared. So hopefully that means that I'll be able to investigate what led to the change in um, kind of, oh, 
I've lost, <laughs> I've lost my thread. Um, what led to the change in um, dominance in that, in that particular niche and also what explained the diversity that we see today since these guys, the um, Chondrichthians are still around and still doing this thing. So I'd just like to thank um, Ben Moon, Matt Williams and Mike Benton for their help with this project. Um, also Sam Giles and Jeff Liston for their work as well. Um, thank you and any questions.